Thank you. Thank you very much. This has been a really fascinating afternoon. I, I've loved these presentations. And a lot of these have been exactly the sort of thing that, that I was going to talk about if somebody else hadn't already spoken about them. Uh, my name is Lee Howard. I'm currently at IPv4 Global, but uh, I was the IPv6 guy for Time Warner Cable, the second largest cable company in the US at the time. And I've spent a few years working on IPv6 uh, translation uh, technologies uh, at, a, at a different company. So where I wanted to start, because we're, we're here at, at the 10th anniversary of World IPv6 Day, is to talk about what that was. I was, my, my experience with World IPv6 Day, I was at an IETF meeting and one of my friends from another cable company came and said, hey Lee, come, come talk to us. There's a group of us over here. And it was a, a few people that I knew uh, from Google and Yahoo and Microsoft who were saying, talking about, why they hadn't deployed IPv6 yet. We all knew we were going to deploy IPv6 eventually, but the question was, why, why haven't you yet? And so the person from one of the content companies said, I'm afraid to enable IPv6 because if something goes wrong, then I'll lose customers to my competitor. And the competitor said, well, that's the same thing that we have. If I deploy IPv6 and something goes wrong, my customers will go to you. So how do we fix that? What if we share the risk? And so we jointly went to uh, IPv. We jointly went to the Internet Society, ISOC, and said, "Can you help us put together an event to to choose a day where we can all deploy IPv6 all at the same time, so that if something does go wrong, then competitors, customers don't go to a competitor because the competitor is having the same problem." And it turned out. So that was June eighth, twenty eleven. It turned out that nothing went wrong. Or the problems that, we, that did happen were very, very minor. The original point was 24 hours. You enable your quad A, your IPv6 DNS record for 24 hours and then turn it back off again. Some people said, you know what? Why would we turn it back off? Nothing, nothing bad happened. Let's just leave it there. Uh, others said, well, the original agreement was we'll turn it off and then figure out when we're all going to enable it later. So after the initial event in 2011, we said, good, that, that, that went well. Those, those content providers came to us, the ISPs, and said, okay, we did it, what are you going to do? And they asked first, can you get to, we wanna see 10% of your users on IPv6 by June, 2012. And I had to say, I can't do, I've got 15 million users, I can't enable 10% of 15 million users in one year, it's just from zero, from where we are now. It was just too much. But I was able to convince our, my CTO that we, could, that we could do 1% of customers. And so that was the commitment we made. It was very helpful to me to be able to say, look, Comcast is making this commitment and AT&T is making this commitment. If all of these other companies are able to make this commitment, then we should be able to do it too. It helps us show that we're uh, at the leading edge of technology deployment. So. You can see the list here of, of companies that were in the original World IPv6 launch. Uh, it turned out my particular company, we, we got to about half of 1% by June 6th. But two weeks later, we were over 1% and, and kept going from there. It became a very organic growth after that. So since then, oh, I, I should mention that there was measurement that uh, the, the content provider said, well, how will we know if you've actually reached 1%? And so each of the content providers reported, measured how much traffic they were seeing, how many hits they were seeing over IPv6 compared to IPv4. And they reported that to ISOC, the Internet Society, who then took those numbers together and reported them out on this page. I'm going to show a lot of different charts and pages today. All of the ones that are public, I'm putting the URL at the bottom. So it's worldipv6launch.org slash measurements. The slides will be available. This meeting is being recorded, so all of this will be available later also. So I don't expect you to write these things down and, and be able to come back to them. So this is the ISOC World IPv6 Launch Measurement Dashboard. And this shows the percentage of IPv6 deployment as measured by the various content providers in their own mechanisms. They each have their own way of measuring. It's, now this is an opt-in. So when a network has decided to begin deploying IPv6, they can email, and the, it's on the page, you can email ISOC and say, hey, I'd like to be added to this page. There's no 
requirements. They just say, okay, you're on. Uh, it's measured by the content providers, but they also, it's ordered by the largest networks, <clears throat> not by percentage of, of IPv6 deployment. And the reason is if there's a small network that's only 10 people and they have 100% IPv6 deployment, that's probably not as important to the global deployment of IPv6 as Reliance Geo, which has 200 million users, 89% of whom are using IPv6. That's pretty significant. So I've, I've shown a, a fair number of, of entries here, but this list goes on for hundreds of networks and it's great data. If you go to this page, you can click on any of those company names and it'll show you the chart over time of how that company has deployed IPv6 over time. Very useful. And it's really especially a good way to see it as a, uh, as a comparison of all the different providers, of how they're, how they're, what, what they're seeing from, uh, from the various networks. Now this is useful, but because it's opt-in, it's only the networks who have said, ISOC, please report on us. The chart that most people use most often that I've seen for, deploy for measuring deployment of IPv6 since World IPv6 Day and World IPv6 launch is Google, right? Major content provider, obviously, <clears throat> they report this, they've been reporting this since before the launch. So you can see back in 2010, it was down under 0%. Interestingly, at the top right, you see the native IPv6 percentage, and then you see a six to four and Toreto percentage. Those were transition technologies from very early on that they were originally seeing some problems with. They saw uh, that some users who were behind those, uh, those technologies were having trouble reaching Google's platform or were having trouble maybe having slow performance. And so it was really, it made them, it, it bothered them, it made them nervous. So they were reporting on that. And for a while it was a few percentage points, but since we're up to 30, actually globally as of last week, 36% uh, at, at peak, uh, speaking, reaching, IPv, reaching Google's platforms over IPv6, the number that's on six to four or Toreto, those are obsolete and, uh, and it doesn't matter anymore. You can see here, so this is one of the interesting trends in the IPv6 deployment in the last 10 years. You can see this line is kind of, how do I say it, shaggy. Um, it goes up and down a lot. I'm going to zoom in and look a little closer. So you can see we have this weekly, this peak and this valley, it goes up and down. And so what we're seeing, what that looks like is <clears throat> on the weekend, IPv6 usage is higher and on weekdays, IPv6 usage is lower. It turns out that that's because mobile carriers and residential ISPs have deployed IPv6 in much greater share than corporate networks, than enterprise networks. And so therefore, when people access Google from work, they, they're less likely to have IPv6. When they access Google from, or YouTube or any of their properties from, from home or over their mobile, then they're more likely to be using IPv6. Every year around the last week of December, the first few days of January, you can see we get this change in the curve. And that's because people aren't at work, right? People are taking holidays and so they're using their phones and they're using their home networks to, to, uh, to reach Google over IPv6. And we can sort of further validate this by saying something happened in, you know, this has been a fairly consistent spread Something happened in March of 2020, where all of a sudden the, the bottom of the curve was much, was much higher. It was a much thinner variance. What happened in March of 2020 that could affect how people reached Google? Well, suddenly a lot of people in a lot of places were reaching Google from home, right? They were, they were working from home. And so, uh, so the, the, the spread narrowed a little bit. It's interesting that as Thing, as life has gotten maybe a little bit back to normal, as more people have deployed, have uh, gone back to the office, that spread has then continued again. So Google's not the only one that measures. I'm gonna show a few others, but uh, they're, they're very similar kinds of curves. Here's Facebook. Uh, I let, what I like about Facebook's measurement, and this is just facebook.com slash IPv6, is they show the current trend. So uh, as of last week, there was, uh, 0.04% weekly growth, but 1.4% monthly growth. Of course, that changes a lot depending on which day, what day you see it. Facebook sees 32% globally. Uh, they also do report uh, more detailed. So if you go to that page, you can see more detailed on country. I don't think they report by, uh, by, by individual network. But so 
uh, great deployment there. Akamai, of course, hosts a lot of content. This particular, as a big CDN, this particular chart, I don't find especially useful. It's just different shades of orange, uh, which is, doesn't provide a lot of contrast, but we can zoom in and take a closer look. They do provide more detail by country. And so I've, I've enlarged some of the ones that are specific to the LACNIC region. We, we saw this in some of the earlier notes that Mexico, Uruguay, Brazil uh, all have uh, significant deployment. Uh, you know, compared to largest countries in the world. And then we can also see large, uh, large networks that have deployed. This again is Reliance Geo, 200 million mobile phone users in India and very close to 100% deployment, very close to 100% of traffic that Facebook, excuse me, that Akamai sees from Reliance Geo is, is over IPv6. And you can expand any of these charts. All of this is to show that these that this deployment is significant and the curves are up and to the right. Here again, very low deployment before World IPv6 launch. This is APNIC, we saw this a minute ago. Uh, this is, and the difference here is the, uh, the what's, how much is capable and how much is, and whether IPv6 is preferred based on whether you receive the IPv6 only image or the IPv4 only image first. What I like to do with APNIC uh, data, though, is I like to drill down a little bit further. Uh, this is information for the Americas. So we can see uh, the deployment levels for uh, each of the individual regions and then uh, country codes, uh, country by country uh, in the subregion. And the closer to green in this colored map on the bottom right or on the right, the closer to green, the higher the level of deployment. So there again, even the places that don't have the highest levels of deployment, still have a significant number of users who are capable of IPv6. Really, we're, uh, let me show one more that's sort of a, a drill into uh, French Guiana has the highest uh, country deployment in, uh, in the region. And so I drilled into French Guiana and then I looked at the networks there and I actually clicked on uh, France Telecom, Orange in French Guiana. So what we see here is this is for this AS the red and blue lines show the, the percentage that is IPv6 capable and IPv6 preferred for that network compared to the yellow and green lines show, uh, show the rest of the country. Well, what this really tells us, and this is true in many countries, if there's one large ISP that, uh, and they deploy IPv6, they can set the, uh, the deployment levels for that country just very, very high. There are other countries that have many, many smaller ISPs, and so it's harder for one network to have that kind of influence. And so comparing country to country isn't always fair. But I mentioned that I was the IPv6 guy at, at my company. It seems like every company that deploys IPv6 has one, one champion who decides or who convinces the rest of the company that we need to deploy IPv6. And so they become that person who leads the company. And, and, and each company has that one person. And that's where, so if we were to go to some of these other networks and find that one person who could be the influencer, the champion, then they would also then be likely to deploy. Well, this is good, but so far I'm showing we've had lots of significant deployment of IPv6 on the, the eyeball networks, right? The ISPs and mobile, <clears throat> what about content? Well, so this is measured from just one network. This is one of Comcast's ASNs. And they show that 30% of the top thousand websites, again, according to Alexa, are reachable over IPv6. That's great. What about higher numbers? So Dan Wing show, reports on the top 25,000, the Alexa 25, top 25,000 domain names. And he's been doing this for years and years. And it's like, I didn't grow, go draw the chart this time, but every day he tests 25,000 uh, domain names. And he's finding 30% have a quad A record. So 35% of domain names have either www or something with an IPv6 address. And yes, there's some small failure rate. So over here on the right, he actually checks the connections. And so out of the 7,498, almost 7,000, almost 7,500 uh, websites that have, IPv have an IPv6 address, 158 have failed. One of the interesting things here is that a lot of these, and actually I should, I'll, I'll point out, he, had, he tests 500,000 once a week. So 25,000 every day, and then once a week he tests 500,000. The numbers are about the same. 
it's still 27% of domains have an IPv6 address. One of the interesting things that I've found is I've looked into who are those domains? Where are they coming from? Who's responsible for that? A lot of them are the domain name speculators, those companies that are buying domain names and just parking them and waiting for a, uh, and waiting for somebody to come along and buy it. They also get a, a quad A. That's fantastic. I, you know, interesting dynamics in the market. In the US, we have the National Institutes of Standard and Technology. They also measure industry. It's interesting to see that uh, two thirds of DNS servers are supporting IPv6 and they show 20% uh, of the websites that they're monitoring uh, support IPv6. Noting that mail has a very low deployment rate on IPv6. And the reason there is that is the reputation. It's the spam fighting technology. A lot of people who are fighting spam are still trying to provide reputation information based on IP address. And it's much simpler to, block, to report a negative reputation for 1 slash 32 in IPv4 than some number in IPv6. How many addresses do you block in IPv6? <clears throat> there are ways around this. There are additional measures that can be taken. But I, I, every time I look at this, I say, this is not the highest priority for IPv6 deployment. If the 50,000 or 100,000 servers in the world that speak SMTP are the last things to migrate to IPv6 and everything else has, I think we're okay. I think those are, that's, that, that's a lower priority. That's my personal opinion. Eric Vinke has provided similar measurements where he's looking at web and email and DNS, and then he's reporting on Google's uh, enabled users. He's reporting this out by country, which is very useful. And one of the things that we've seen the deployment grow over 10 years is that I would not have thought that web deployment for IPv6 would be quite so high in Guernsey or Tonga or Equatorial Guinea. It turns out that the reason there tends to be that these are the most popular domain names in those countries are often hosted by either they're hosted by Google or they're hosted by one of the big CDNs that automatically provides IPv6 to their users. So that makes it even simpler for IPv6 to get deployed there. And so it's almost a case where the less dynamic infrastructure, the less uh, specific engineers are being on their network deployment, the more likely they are to have IPv6 in those cases. Again, email and DNS may be a little bit interesting. The, uh, one of the great things that Eric is providing also, he provides a lot of tools on this site, and I think they're fantastic. One of them is you can compare IPv6 deployment by country. And so you can see in here, I've compared the US to uh, French Guinea, uh, Mexico, Brazil, and Uruguay. And so the US is in blue fairly flat over the past three years, but obviously it was zero in 2011 or very close to zero. Whereas Uruguay had a rapid deployment in uh, 2018 or is it late 2017? And then a gradual deployment since then. Brazil, very gradual deployment. You can look at these and imagine that the countries that have one network that is responsible for a lot of users, when that network deploys, you see a huge sudden increase and, and then it flattens out, but all of them are still up and to the right. So all of these are continuing to grow. And it looks to me like that's a, a fairly consistent pace, right? Once you reach some kind of um, plateau or equilibrium, then it's gradual growth from there. I'm gonna come back to that point in just a minute. So it's not just the deployment. That's not, maybe not even the most interesting part of the story. The protocol IPv6 has changed. I don't wanna say the protocol has changed, but some of the, the technologies around it have evolved. Uh, Happy Eyeballs was probably one of the first. RFC 8305 was, uh, is a, a second version of Happy Eyeballs. So soon after deployment began in earnest in 2012, a few people got together and said, we're worried that we may be giving, if something does go wrong, that we may be providing a bad experience to users. And we don't want users to have a bad experience, right? These are, the IPv6 deployment should be invisible to them. <clears throat> so they came up with an algorithm that says, try IPv6, try IPv4, whichever one works better, use that one. After 
seven or eight years, I forget exactly, uh, they, they, we, they came back and said, we have much better measurements now. It looks like the best experience is try IPv6, wait a few milliseconds, and if you haven't already heard a response, try IPv4. And that way, if IPv6 is much slower or if there's a problem with IPv6, you're still quickly falling back to, to IPv4. Each of the different operating systems has a slightly different way to implement that, but it is a great way to make sure that users are, are un, less likely to see problems. The other hand, uh, we see that it kind of hides problems. Users don't complain if IPv6 is down and IPv4 is working, they don't notice. So they don't complain. If IPv4 is down, but IPv6 is working, it's, it's fine, there's, there's no problem. And so uh, you have to, so monitoring has actually become a little bit more difficult because we can't see what necessarily is, is breaking. Uh, we have to, you have to be a little bit more careful in your, in your monitoring. Also in that time, it's very interesting how the, the set of transition mechanisms has changed significantly in the past 10 years where we had six to four, six over uh, four over six, nat, uh, nat six four, which I suppose uh, still exists in many cases. Uh, since then, we've published, the IETF has published 464 XLAT, where you have a translation from IPv4 to IPv6. You go through the network over IPv6, and then you have a translation from IPv6 to IPv4. You have MAP-T and MAP-E, so you're doing either translation or encapsulation, stateless. Um, and we have SIITDC, which allows you to do some uh, transition at the edge of your data center. So all of these are, are more modern transition mechanisms, and I'm going to come back to why that's significant and how that's affected <clears throat> some of our measurements and deployments. Uh, so that's been a major, uh, that it's, that's been a, a set of, of, it's changed how we deploy IPv6 in the past 10 years. And in many ways, it's made it easier and cheaper. One of the coolest new things in IPv6 is segment routing. Uh, still a little bit, uh, uh, it, it's, it's still very exciting because there's still new people are coming up with new ways to do it and new, uh, new ideas. Um, base, basic use case is to provide something like an MPLS network, but using native IP instead of having to have uh, a shim, an, a layer inserted between layer two and layer three. So it makes things a, a lot simpler potentially on your network. Uh, but the coolest thing is the network as a computer. I have not e tried this even in the lab. There's a bunch of great presentations on using, because you have so much address space in IPv6, you can designate uh, intermediate hops along your path and, ha and provide instructions in the address space to those intermediate hops and tell them, go perform additional uh, processing on this packet or on this flow. Some really neat stuff in there, none of which is required to deploy IPv6. You can certainly deploy IPv6 without, without any of this, but it, makes, but it provides much more interesting nuanced. We're still finding out additional things that we can do with this. There's uh, performance and diagnostic metrics. This is sort of uh, the initial level. There may be additional enhancements to this. Using destination options, we can see, we can provide diagnostic information in the IP packet itself, rather than providing, trying to provide metadata around the packet. And that potentially provides much more interesting, useful information for, for troubleshooting. <laughs> I can hear myself speeding up, talking faster, because I get so excited about this. Some of the basic features in IPv6 that are just, just slightly different from IPv4 are, have, been, have had a few more enhancements. None of these will change how you deploy IPv6 at a basic level. You're certainly uh, you can certainly deploy IPv6 without knowing significantly more than you needed to know 10 years ago. But we've made just things, things just a little bit better, a little bit easier in a lot of cases, and definitely more useful. So we've got a few more uh, enhancements that have come out of the six man, six IPv6 maintenance working group in IETF. And we have a lot more guidance documents. If you're wondering what's best practice for deploying to my data center, my enterprise network, my ISP, there's documents for each of those use cases. And the best thing that's happened in 10 years is there's a lot more vendor support. It's much easier to get support out of your vendors and at least vendors seem a little bit embarrassed now when you ask them if they have IPv6 support and they say no. One of the things that, I, so I mentioned the transition mechanisms and how that's changed how we deploy. We're seeing lower latency over IPv6 and I've said this many times before, 
and nobody believes me. And I've had violent arguments with when I say, everybody who measures IPv6 latency compared to IPv4 says that IPv6 is faster. And, and I've had arguments where people say, it can't be faster, but it is. And so I, so I tried to say, why is that? I've got a blog post at, at Team Aaron here uh, describing, I think there might be two possibilities. One is, I mentioned happy eyeballs, right? Where so you launch a TCP, uh, uh, you initiate a TCP session over IPv6. If you don't immediately hear a response, you start the session over IPv4. Maybe then you hear the response over IPv6. And you send, you begin your web connection over IPv6 just as you're receiving your IPv4 response. And somehow there's a race condition where maybe it looks like IPv6 broke when in fact all that happened was IPv4 got there a little bit faster. <clears throat> so I think that's part of what, what may be happening. But what I really tested in this blog post is I think that that 464 XLAT technology, uh, and so Apple said all new applications in, on, our, on iOS must support IPv6 and they make app developers certify that they tested it over NAT64 or other IPv6 only technology. And if it doesn't support IPv6, they say, look, we, we, we promised you, we told you that it would, so that's not our fault. <clears throat> Google said, we're more open than that. We don't have that kind of control. So instead they said for applications that either have a literal IPv4 address or for other reason require IPv4, they inserted a layer, an IPv4 to IPv6 translator in the Android handset. And that IPv4 to IPv6 translation, that CLAT, I think is adding just a couple of milliseconds of delay, maybe even just a few hundred microseconds, but it adds up. And so, and I've not been able to get Google to confirm this for me, but I've had an engineer or two there say, well, yeah, that, from what I understand, that makes sense. So, so on that basis, it makes sense that IPv6 would be a little bit faster because you don't have to go through that layer of translation in the handset. Why does that matter? Well, we all want faster internet access. Just in general, we, want, we like faster internet access, but also Google ranks web, websites in its search results one of the rankings is based on speed. So a faster website gets higher ranked in Google search results. I've included, again, this is from APNIC, they measure V6 performance. I've included samples here from the various sub regions uh, in, in the Americas and all of them show IPv6 being faster and there, but there's significant variation from country to country. So you might wanna take a look at your specific country by going to that site. Okay. that's the past 10 years, what does the future look like? So I always warn people that predicting the future is dangerous. And so uh, I'm just looking at what has happened and trying to think about what could happen in the future. So don't go spending money based on what I say the future might look like. Having warned you, this is again, this is Eric Vinke again, provides a great tool where you can extrapolate trends over time. In this case, I'm using Google's data on worldwide IPv6 deployment and saying, show me an, an S curve. So technology deployment tends to, new technologies tend to deploy slowly at the beginning and then faster in the middle and then have a long tail where deployment tapers off. So the trouble is you don't know where you are on the S curve until later on the curve. So uh, this may not actually happen, even if it does, take into account that we've had some changes in how the world works in the past year. Maybe it's maybe we're at 60% in three years, but I can try different curves. So um, if I use a polynomial, in this case, I'm using a fifth order polynomial because it looked like the best fit. This is just a complicated math equation that says, what if what's the best curve that fits the past data? And what happens if that curve continues on into the future? Well, if these trends continue, it, it provides, by the way, a higher order polynomial, puts more emphasis on more recent data. So if there's been a recent uh, acceleration in IPv6 deployment, the curve will look steeper with a higher order polynomial. In this case, you could say, all right, we're two years away from having 100% deployment of IPv6 worldwide. I'm a little skeptical, but uh, the curves, you know, you, you could read that into the curve. So there's lots of different ways you can read these curves. 
when I look at this curve, and something that came up in the last presentation, uh, Sebastian and Diego, that was really, really interesting. And I can't wait to look into more of what you've written because I wanted to look at how does the price of IPv4, how does this IPv4 address market, has that affected the, the IPv6 deployment at all? So price per address has been increasing. This is public data, you can uh, pull it yourself, but this is, so I drew a similar kind of curve. I believe this again is a fifth order polynomial. Uh, and this curve, 99% uh, of, of IPv4 address sales fit on this curve. If this curve continues, if we keep seeing prices accelerate, we could see prices at $100 per address. This is US dollars by 2023, in two years, about the same time as the previous chart showed IPv4, IPv6 support being 100%. Is that actually what's gonna happen? Part of me hopes so, because that's good for the internet if everybody has free addresses. So is there an actual correlation if we've seen any changes in the market or, or in IPv6 deployment? So I plotted, here's a chart where I've compared Google's data what percentage of, of hits to Google is over IPv6? That's the, the light blue line and the percentage on the left. The dark blue line is the number of IPv4 addresses that have been transferred worldwide. Any transfer, I've excluded mergers and acquisitions. I think that those are name changes. They don't count as, as an address market, people trying to acquire addresses to meet their, their, growth, their network growth needs. It looks to me like both of those are pretty linear. Right, the, there was a, a surge in the number of addresses from uh, sometime late 2017 through sometime, what's that, late 2018. So a year or so in there where the number of addresses increased, there was one big buyer who I think was the influence there. They stopped buying and the market flattened out again. Uh, again, the light blue line, you can see those spikes every year. That's the, the, the January New Year holiday where everybody's working from home. So uh, I don't see much change here. And I certainly, maybe, maybe I can see where the company that was doing large purchases in 2017 in the dark blue line, when that, when that line accelerated, maybe the light blue line shows that there was also an, an acceleration in IPv6 deployments, maybe just a little bit earlier than that. Uh, I think that's true. Uh, so maybe, so, so that I saw that and wondered are companies that are buying and selling IP addresses, IPv4 addresses, are they deploying IPv6 or are they not deploying IPv6? My thought was that companies that sell IPv4 addresses have plenty of IPv4 address space and therefore they're not deploying. I haven't found a good way to study this. So if somebody has a suggestion, I'd be really happy to hear it and look into it further but I looked at some of the largest sellers of IPv4 address space over time. This is the complete history of the IPv4 address market since 2011 or 2012. And I looked at who has transferred the most addresses. I don't even know whether these are sales necessarily. So these are the sellers. And I tried to look at what percentage is, what percent of their network is using IPv6. I used, uh, again, Jeff Houston's data at, at APNIC, uh, DuPont, that ASN was so small, I couldn't find any measurement at all. Nortel, doesn't matter. That Bell Northern Research, the company doesn't exist anymore. So they have no deployment of IPv4 or IPv6. GE, again, I couldn't find any data. MIT, now we're talking, we have a very large organization that had a very large IPv4 address sale and almost 29% of their traffic hitting Google is using IPv6. So that's that would say, that the sale of IPv4 addresses did not change their IPv6. On the other hand, maybe they used some of that, the funds to promote their IPv6 deployment. I don't actually know. Then again, MIT is a little bit different. They're not a for-profit company. CSC, 0%. They sold a lot of addresses. They have no IPv6 deployment. This API DTT was wide in Japan. Uh, donated addresses to APNIC to promote IPv, uh, to promote internet, internet deployment in the APNIC region, major uh, block of addresses. So there wasn't actually a network there, although it's worth saying that WIDE has been a major promoter of IPv6. So no, no direct correlation though. Merit sold a lot of addresses, small IPv6 deployment, level three, small IPv6 deployment, Xerox, 
no IPv6. SFR, 14%. I don't see any correlation here. I, I don't see a pattern. Buyers, on the other hand, I also don't see a pattern. Uh, again, I have not figured, many of the largest buyers of IPv4 addresses have been, are, are the cloud providers. Um, my opinion, based on the reading that I've done about feature sets of the cloud providers, is that Amazon's IPv6 capabilities are the best among the largest cloud providers, but you still can't reach their console over IPv6. You can't do any of your management over IPv6. So there's a little bit of a, a split there. Microsoft, you can enable load balancers. They have VNet over IPv6, and that's it. And you can't reach their domain name. You can, you can read the rest of this. I still don't see a direct correlation between how many IPv4 addresses a company buys and how much IPv6 deployment they have. But I don't have a rigorous way to test this. So if somebody has a suggestion of how to do this research or would like to do the research, I would really love to see uh, the results here. So I have um, just really kind of one more summary, which is to say, obviously the internet is still growing. The IPv6 deployment, we call it up and to the right. It looks to me like it's a fairly linear uh, rate of growth, which is about the same as the rate of growth or the rate of turnover in the internet. So in many cases, a, a network will deploy IPv6 to all the devices, all the end users or endpoints that can support IPv6. And then as those become, as those become old equipment and they get recycled, the new equipment does support IPv6 and their trend, their deployment level keeps growing. 35% IPv6 deployment globally is, has very little to do with your local deployment. Uh, that's much more related to, as uh, the, the folks at uh, SMC Plus said, um, much more to do with your local uh, economic factors. It is definitely more stable and better supported now than it was in 2011. Thank goodness. It was, in many ways, it was very difficult. Although I don't want to over, I don't want to make it sound more complicated than it is. IPv6 is that most of the cost is in the labor of updating your systems, writing maybe if you have custom software that you've written, it's updating that, it's deploy, it's testing and deploying configurations. In terms of people, always the biggest barrier that people talk about is not knowing about IPv6 but really with just a few hours of research, you can learn enough to make significant start on your IPv6 deployment plan. And there's certainly a lot of training available, including through LACNIC, thank you. It's great to see that the available features in IPv6 continue to be enhanced. That's not to say that IPv6 is not stable. The, the, the base specifications have been published as full standards. So they're not being, the base uh, protocols are not being changed but we're finding new and interesting things that we can do with them that extend our capabilities, which makes it, which means that we have more that we can do. And as time goes on and more people are using IPv6, we're going to be we'll continue to find more interesting things that we can do since we have all these addresses. And you may disagree with me and I'd like to find a better way to do some, uh, some really scientific research, but it does not look to me like there's any correlation, no strong correlation at least, between the IPv4 address market and the deployment of IPv6. So I see that we have a couple of questions. Oh, please do feel free. My email address Muchísima. is here. There's a reason my email address Muchísima is here. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you. Muchísimas gracias, Lee. Eh, no sé si me escuchas bien. Ahora yes. sí, tendremos sí. unos minutos para poder responder algunas preguntas. Tenemos preguntas del público. Bien, eh, estas preguntas están en español. Eh, es de Jorge Blanco. Él pregunta si una empresa tiene toda su infraestructura tecnológica con soporte IPv6, ¿usted recomienda migrar toda la red y servicio a un IPv6 nativo o hay que seguir con IPv6, IPv4 por algún tiempo? That's a really good and interesting question. There are a few companies, Facebook famously is one of them. I think LinkedIn is now one of them who have deployed IPv6 entirely, IPv6 only inside their network. They Facebook has no IPv4 nodes in
¿Ya? ¿Qué tal? ¿Se cortó la comunicación? Se me cortó okay. el I, me parece. Sí, sí pareciera. Dick, can you hear me? Oh. Hola, Carlos. Sí, yo te escucho a ti perfectamente. Sí, creo que se perdió la conexión con, con Lee. Bien. Ok. Quizás si te parece. No. Ahí viene. Ahí retornó. Sí, conexión IPv4. Ajá. Hola. Bien, seguimos con la siguiente pregunta. Eh, la pregunta es de Rosy Valle. Eh, ella pregunta si existen estadísticas regionales basadas en el análisis de técnicas de Tumlen para coexistencia de IPv4 de IPv e IPv6. Oh, so, something just happened to Zoom and I don't have the translation, so I'm going to turn that back oh. on. But I, think I, but I think I understand the question. Now, now I can. Okay. Yes, thank you. Now I can hear you. Uh, Are there regional statistics based on uh, uh, the analysis on tunneling versus? Co I don't know of any such analysis because it's very difficult to tell from outside the network whether it's a tunnel or whether it's native IPv6. Uh, the, tu the tunnel mechanisms that used specific addresses, uh, dedicated addresses for the tunnel Uh, changed are, are not really in, in use anymore. So it's, it's still very difficult. The same question, there was a question earlier today about carrier grade NAT. It's, it's much the same answer where it's very hard to, to see how much carrier grade NAT is being used in a network compared to IP, native IPv4 or IPv6. There was a paper three or four years ago, I don't have it off the top of my head, that that did some inference on how to measure uh, carrier grade NAT, but um, uh, it's not public, that I don't think it's public data that we can keep referring to to compare. I hope I answered that question. And I can read this, the Bien. third question. Muchas gracias, Lee. Uh, uh, la tercera pregunta está en inglés. If you prefer, you can read the, the question. So, I found the study on latency improvement in IPv6 very interesting. Okay. From your experience, do you think there's also some kind of improvement in downstream bandwidth speed in IPv6 networks compared to IPv4 networks? So the, the measurement of throughput does is affected by latency. So lower latency does mean that you will see more you know, megabits per second of, of, of throughput, of good put data being transferred. And you'll see that Uh, that, that effect is multiplied depending on the number of, uh, of set concurrent sessions that you have open. So for a website that opens 10 simultaneous uh, HTTP sessions, you may get a minor improvement over, uh, in, over IPv6 compared to something that does it over 100 sessions. You may have a significantly faster uh, 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 throughput because of the lower latency. Now with more modern protocols, um, there's uh, HTTP is, and HTTPS are doing uh, more interesting uh, connection mechanisms so that you don't necessarily see those. I think Quick uh, changes that so that you don't open TCP sessions. Quick is handling it itself higher in the stack. Um, we've, I'm sorry, I've gone way off of the topic of IPv6 now. So I'm not, so I don't know that there's a direct correlation. I do know that I had Uh, I had some measurement tools throughout my network at, at Time Warner Cable around the US measuring the top 20 websites and that, that our users were going to. And the correlation, it was, there was a slight preference for IPv6 that was a little bit faster in terms of round trip time and therefore in term, and, and a slight preference in terms of, of throughput, but it was only very slight and it was not consistent. It depends on where you're connected, where, the peer, where your peering is, and the throughput, of course, how fast the, the website is, is responding. Muchas gracias, Lee. Eh, vamos con la última pregunta. Es de Oscar Ledesma. Dice, buenas tardes. 
¿Qué incentivos se podrían dar a los ISP para que continúen, comiencen con la adopción en IPv6? The, the biggest thing that I see, well, so I think that every network operator needs to do their own, needs to answer the question for themselves. The biggest incentive can be if you're growing faster than you can acquire IPv4 addresses, uh, then that's a pretty good incentive. I don't know how fast the, the price of IPv4 addresses will rise. Um, as an IPv4 address broker, it's, you know, I, I'm sort of interested in seeing how fast they rise, but, it's, but I can't make a decision for you, for any ISP. Uh, what I can say is the, the biggest thing is if you're doing NAT, then uh, I know that T-Mobile, uh, a large uh, mobile carrier in the US, cut their NAT cost in half by deploying IPv6. They had, and, th and that was their biggest reason for deploying IPv6. They wanted to, to reduce the cost of the extra boxes that they had to buy. Uh, I've done this over uh, in, in Linux using uh, VPP. There are ways to do it very fast in, uh, in software and you can do translation and have native IPv6. So it can be fairly simple, fairly cheap to do that translation. Uh, Nick.mx did a great uh, jewel, provided a great uh, translation tool. So the, the tools exist, uh, but the, the incentive is, are you going to be able to continue growing? That's, that's really it. I guess the one other way I'd put it is, look at how long is it before you need IPv6 or before your users tell you that they need IPv6 for something, whether it's gaming or accessing a website or accessing, accessing something else that's IPv6 only, how long is that? And then compare that to how long will it take you to deploy IPv6? If your users will want something in three years that requires IPv6, but it's going to take you five years to deploy, uh, you're in trouble and you need to get, you need to work pretty fast. <laughs> 